It's my pleasure to introduce um, Phil Heiduck as our next speaker. Um, I, know, I first met you first, Jerome, before before we have your distinguished guest. Oh, sorry. <laughs> He's an alum from the university. We're excited. But I also wanted to introduce Jerome Ung, who leads the AppBee Innovation Center at the Research Park and also works on academic partnerships. Many of you may know AbbVie's Innovation Center at the Research Park is the largest employer of students, and they have immersive experiences to work on not only data sciences, but other ways to impact human health and drug development. Um, Jerome leads a group that includes library scientists, graphic designers, and software experts, robotic process automation, and other types of work. He spent six years at the University at the College of Engineering and at the Geese College of Business. And so we're delighted that he has this leadership role. And I'm going to give it back to you, Jerome. Please introduce your guest, Bill Heideck. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, and thank you for having um, both Phil and I at the Day Big Data Summit. Um, so a little bit about Phil. I first met Phil uh, just over a year ago when I was interviewing to join AppV and the AppV Innovation Center. During our conversation, I asked Phil about his vision for the center and he said, I don't want it to be a factory. So far for 2020, the AIC has hosted 143 unique students and 94 different projects across all of AppV, most of which are within IR and re research and development. Some of these projects included a team of students who built out a brand new data analysis framework for an ongoing clinical trial, a PhD student who explored the application of neural, neuronal network approach uh, to analyzing single cell RNA sequence data sets, and a pair of students who created two physical prototypes and a drug delivery pump carrier intended to promote patient adherence to their treatment plan. From that conversation, I also recall Phil sharing that belief was one of his top five Clifton strengths. Over this past year, I've witnessed Phil's belief in the contributions that we in information research make to our colleagues in R&D. I've seen Phil encourage us to push the boundaries of what we think we can achieve. And most importantly, I've observed how Phil has fostered a fun, collaborative, and nimble culture throughout all of IR. Today, Phil will share with us his insights on the rise of cognitive search. Please welcome home a fellow Illini, um, Phil Heideck, Vice President for Information Research. Thanks, Jerome. And it, if everyone can notice, uh, there's a theme in the imagery with Spider-Man. Um, <laughs> I didn't realize you put that on your on your image, but it's uh, it's great to be here. Um, I didn't realize we um, employed the largest number of students at the research park, so um, that's uh, that's new. Uh, that's that's exciting, but it, that's been a great partnership. And Jerome's uh, been doing a great job with Kirsten as well, who's come on board. Uh, um, yeah, and I know we only have about twenty minutes or so, so I just threw together uh, ten or so slides, and I, I tried to do something different. Um, and, and usually when you think of a big data summit, um, you think of, of, the, of the very deep analyses, uh, you know, looking at, you know, large statistical analyses across populations or across, you know, biomedical literature and, and other things. And, and that's, you know, absolutely important. It's stuff that we do all the time. Uh, I've been on kind of a, a 10 year uh, journey of really trying to solve a different big data problem, uh, one that is you know, just as pervasive and that, that, you know, the Googles of the world have, have done a good job on the external literature, but how do we do it uh, behind the walls of, of any kind of corporation? So I, I call this the rise of cognitive search. Uh, my organization is called Information Research. Um, but, you know, the, the next couple of slides are, are going to look very familiar, right? And, and that is, you know, we, we are awash in data, right? We, are, we have no shortage of data <clears throat> from a pharmaceutical perspective. You know, what our scientists have to deal with is, is trolling through patent literature. When patents come out with new molecules, we've got hundreds of thousands of new patents a year. Uh, from a clinical trial perspective, there's more than 25,000 new drugs against new diseases run every year that we have to understand what our competitive position is. Uh, and then the literature alone, you've got, you know, 35,000 new articles. And this is on top of the news. And there's a lot of really important information that comes out in the news feeds, uh, web uh, websites, things that are announced that really aren't in any kind of structured format, but they they come anyway. Genomics is crazy, right? And we have a, a, a large genomics research center here. Uh, great partnership with the NCSA down at U of I in terms of storing those data and being able to do compute at scale. But you know, we're looking at uh, tens of billions, um, you know, in in the coming years in, in terms of the number of genomes. How do you deal with that? 
And then you have all the other data. Um, you know, there's over a million compounds or close to 2 million compounds in Shemble alone. Uh, everything is connected to pathways. How do you deal with this, right? And this is just the external data. So this isn't data that we deal with you know, internally. Inside, we do all kinds of stuff. We make more than 40,000 new small molecules a year, more than 40,000 biologics a year. Uh, we run hundreds of thousands of, of experiments and projects um, that, we, that we kind of put forward every year. Uh, and just in our document shares alone, right? We, we have 9 million documents in SharePoint. Uh, these are documents that were internally generated by Epi scientists. Um, what is terrifying to me from a knowledge perspective is some of the most important decisions that we make as an organization. And this is true in just about every corporation, right? Some of the most important decisions that we make are stored in those SharePoint documents, right? So where we bring all the data together and understand how it all links together to support a particular uh, decision for moving forward or not moving forward, uh, we tend to capture in PowerPoint uh, in some way, shape or form. It's presented to upper management and then it's lost forever uh, in, in SharePoint or some of these other forums. So how do we capture that um, in, in the field that we're in as well? So this is in fact a big data problem. It hits all the four Bs of big data. We got huge volume, different types of data. It's changing all the time. Um, you know, the bottom V of veracity, you know, how true is it is, is something that uh, we, we wrestle with all the time, but, but this moves us from being a data company and a data discovery company to more of a knowledge company, right? The pharmaceutical research business, it is a science business, but it is more and more becoming a knowledge business, right? Some of our ability to find the right targets and to find the right drugs and to find the right patient population uh, and to move that to the right markets is more and more, what do you know and how do you know it, right? And it's not just keeping up with the data. It's not just getting alerts, right? Just kind of finding out when stuff comes in. It's how do we do enterprise knowledge discovery, right? Timely actual insights, you know, accelerating that time to decision and, and those novel connections. And this is kind of what I'm calling cognitive search, right? It's, it's the AI driven version of, of enterprise search that uses all the same types of big data technologies, right? It's, you, we're dealing with graph theory, we're dealing with AI ML techniques to learn, you know, what people might want to use. Uh, this is what uh, we refer to as, as cognitive search. Um, and, and I want to talk about knowledge for a minute because there's this matrix of epistemic uncertainty, right, which um, uh, many of you might, might have seen before, but, but we actually use it to position the different technologies that we're bringing to bear and, and trying to answer what problems are we trying to solve, right? And, and when you think about the perceived state of knowledge, right, what, what I think I know versus the actual state of knowledge, you know, what I actually know, you know, there's, there's the known knowns, um, and these are, these are the reports, right? These are the databases that I have. I know that I know them, right? And I want to be able to retrieve them quickly. There's the unknown knowns. These are things I forgot, right? Or maybe the organization knew it at some point in time, right? This, this starts to get into those PowerPoint documents that contain the decision on why we terminated a program or why we uh, chose to go after this target and all of that knowledge is contained in that PowerPoint, and it's now on someone's personal share drive, right? So how do I how do I know the things that we knew at one point, right? This is organizational recall, collective memory. Um, then there's the things I know I don't know, right? So I, I I know I don't know it, and I want to go find out about it. These are our gaps. This is where I want to go do additional data mining, additional text text mining. I want to go do some analyses to actually discover new things. And then that last category is, is the unknown unknowns, right? This is where you know, we don't know that we don't know, uh, but we could use things like you know, unsupervised machine learning or unsupervised artificial intelligence techniques to go in and identify insights that we didn't even know existed. And sometimes that we didn't even know how to ask those certain questions. And what I would say in the, in the big data field, um, there's really a lot of excitement around this unknown unknown uh, this gets the most attention. This is where you know people are going in and trying to derive those those novel insights. Uh, and and what I would say is, you know, don't underestimate the power of doing these things very well. Right when you're when you're in an enterprise kind of knowledge organization, and when you are trying to drive the work of forty eight thousand people across the globe, doing these three really really well 
is at least as powerful. It's certainly more powerful for masses uh, than, than doing this really well. Uh, we need to do them all, uh, but this becomes very, very specialized. Um, these tend to be very, very generalized. So you're gonna touch more people um, and, and you're gonna touch more decisions when you do those well. So we have this balance um, that, that we're always fighting of, of how do we do uh, the known knowns really well? How do we do the unknown unknowns really well? And what, what's the balance between those? So that kind of sets up a framework for uh, the, the work that we do and the challenges that we're trying to, to address. Um, and, and what I will say is we, like I said we have to do both, right? And, and the way that we try to enable both is, you know, how do you drive decision-making across all of our different data sets? So this is just a subset of the different types of data uh, that exist in a pharmaceutical organization as we move a molecule uh, from you know, discovering a target where you're reading the literature, you're making molecules, you're analyzing those molecules, you're understanding whether they work in animals, whether they're toxic. Uh, and then we move that through the various clinical safety and, and other databases to finally get something to market. How are we making decisions across all of those? I, I, I depicted these in this way because in fact, they are silos. Um, they are silos today. Uh, they're silos in every organization. Um, and how do we start to connect these, right, and bring these together so that I can actually discover, if you think of that matrix again, what is known across all of these different silos and how do we share that uh, with each other? So that's that, you know, across a different pipeline, deep integrated query, right? So we don't want to have surface level information. We actually want people to be able to dive into the data once they find something. But it's this, it's this magic of trying to allow query across all these different databases at the same time, right? So how do, you, how do you link the data that's here in chemistry to the real world data that's happening in a real patient, right? These are, these are different domains. These are, there's no link between these data that's, that's natural or obvious, uh, but there are ways to trace connections between entities if you move to a graph type framework. Um, so we're trying to enable deep integrated query within a database as well as, as query at scale. Um, and, and that's where you actually want this interoperability, right? You want the ability to go back and forth between uh, these different databases that when you find something at scale, the ability to dive back into uh, a toxicology result or a chemistry result, for example. So this is what we have set out to build um, to, to enable both of those things. And, and just an idea of some of the data that we're dealing with, right? So, so we're, we're moving to this, this graph framework for, for how we uh, interact with everything. Uh, it's just the connectedness of data. It's a very natural framework for, for working with things. But it, we, we tend to work in these different domains. Um, we, we tend to do all of our discovery work over here, um, uh, either in animals or test tubes. Uh, we tend to do all of our other you know, clinical trials, obviously, in, in people and all the vast amount of data that's available on, on people, either in the literature of the world. But we're starting to bring all these data together. Um, and, and the numbers are, you know, they're not big, <laughs> they're not petabytes of data, but, but they're pretty massive. Um, you know, so we've got data on, on over 8 million compounds, that's over 30 million bioactivity measurements, we have over 10 million in vivo endpoints, right, that's just our preclinical uh, database. Uh, if, you, if you scrape the literature for all known associations between drugs and diseases or diseases and, and adverse events or genes, right, you, we've been able to extract out over 180 million different relationships. You know, GWAS and FIWAS studies, you're into the millions in terms of statistically significant associations, kind of and so on. And the question is, how do you stitch, you know, what will eventually be billions of data points together uh, in a way that's actually usable? Right? And that can be searched, and that could be mined, and that could be usefully uh, interrogated by our scientific community. And, and it's by linking these together that we're actually able to put together a full picture of, of what does it mean to go from research, where we're trying to discover these new drugs and these new targets, and seamlessly connect that to what's happening in people. Um, whether we're talking about clinical trials or adverse events or real world data sets or, or human genetics, and being able to link all that back. And some of this is pretty straightforward. Um, where you just have a direct report of an association between a gene or a disease. Some of it is using new population uh, type statistics to actually infer association between things, very much like we do with GWAS and PWAS today. But the types of math that are used here could be used to talk about targets or genes or in vivo effects. And it's 
association with an adverse event in people if you have sufficient data to drive the connection. So we can start to do these associations from the preclinical domain into the clinical domain uh, and also make that available as knowledge in the graph. Um, so, so we're building this out. Um, we, this is, it's about, we're about six years in, so we're, we're pretty far along uh, in terms of, of what we have. And, it, and what's interesting is when you, when, you, when you roll tools like this out to, you know, again, we have, we have um, lots of people in our organization. Uh, we recently acquired uh, Allergan Aesthetics. So we went from a 30,000 employee company to a 48,000 employee company that just happened this year. So how are we doing this for the entire enterprise? Um, and and the, the thing is you, you have to have that broad and that focused use, right? The, the deep AI and machine learning is not for 48,000 people. It's probably for 100 uh, in our organization. The search for knowledge should be for 48,000 people if we do our job right. So how do we take all that data and turn it into knowledge, connect that across different data sources and then expose it um, to, to the community, all again, using this underlying graph framework uh, to make this performant uh, and very, very powerful. So, so we have these three pillars of, of what we're rolling out to our, to our end users. Uh, the first is very simple search. This is Google search, right? But it's Google search uh, powered with our internal data and powered with our own uh, kind of AI and ML and graph techniques to, to expose scientific types of data. Um, and this is a query across all databases, right? And you could search for a simple term. Uh, it looks just like Google, you put it in and you get all the information that you would want that comes out of the graph directly for, for that particular search. Um, this is the, the general tool. And then we move to people who, you know, really want to see the graph. Um, they, they're, they're very visual. They wanna see the neighborhood around a particular entity. Um, and so we have tools to do that as well, where someone could go in and search uh, on the connections between things. And this is starting to expose very small subsets of the graph, um, small enough that are you know, manageable by an end user, um, but they could go in and, and do those searches on their own. And then there's the direct interrogation of the graph itself, where we might have a billion different nodes and edges uh, in the graph, where we wanna do these advanced AI techniques. And this continuum all sitting on a graph framework allows us to tackle all four quadrants of that, that matrix of epistemic uncertainty, right? So we, we can really tackle the known knowns very well, which serves the broadest community uh, by, by simple search uh, and, and, and limited visualization over some of the entities. While we're also allowing those new insights, the things that I know I don't know or that I don't know I don't know um, using these advanced AI techniques or visualization techniques uh, to interrogate the graph directly. Um, and, and this idea of visualization, um, just to land on, I know we talk about the four V's of, of big data. Uh, there, there is this fifth V. This visualization is really hard. Uh, these graphs get very, very big. They get hard to interpret. And so doing this well is kind of that fifth V of the big data framework uh, on top of a variety of velocity and, and veracity and volume. Um, and and the ability to, to bring up a graph that is with entities that people recognize that they can engage with it and see those linkages that make sense uh, to them to, to drive a specific decision. Uh, there's lots of tools to do this, so we're not creating new tools to do this, but how that is served up to the community and how that's done well, that user experience and user journey is really, really hard. So we've actually just started a new initiative to completely map out the user experience what does a user want to experience as they move from search to visualization to advanced analytics? Uh, what's their journey? And, and there's not just one journey, there's many journeys. So we're, we're kind of mapping that out. We're gonna do a complete revamp of the system in the next year uh, from what we learned on the basis of those results. So I said this would be a little bit different. Um, uh, in, in fact, it was, but it, it, it is the problem that we're dealing with uh, at, at Abbey at scale uh, at this point kind of where we are, um, you know, we, we've come a long way. I said this has been about a six year journey for us. Um, we started in discovery. We have now moved this to, to an enterprise tool across all of AbbVie. Uh, that, that early focus was on the research data. And, and now it's really moving beyond that. And, and what started out as a scientific tool, right, we're really answering questions on how do you pick the right target or the right patient is finding really surprising applications in non-scientific areas, right? If you think of 
a quality organization or an operations type organization where they're really not doing a lot of new science. These graph frameworks and the ability to connect things together, uh, very, very powerful applications in these non-scientific areas. So that's a, a really exciting area of growth. Um, currently, we've got about 6,000 users, right? So of the 30,000, it's not quite the entire organization yet. Uh, of the 48,000 of new employees, we, we have a whole bunch of new people to introduce to the platform. But as I said, this kind of grew. Uh, we got about 100% penetration in the discovery organization, and this is now growing as we as we roll this out to the enterprise. Um, uh, this this balance between user experience and effectiveness is is really really tough. Um, and and while I mentioned veracity as as one of the big four Bs in in the first uh, one of those early slides, I didn't talk about it at all. This is the hardest one to deal with, uh, you know, by far. And, and this this happens all the time uh, when we have an, an association from the literature data. And of course, there's been the, the publications in the recent years on you know 50% of the literature data is irreproducible. Um, so when we get a result internally that doesn't match the result externally, number one, are those data captured adequately so I could put those side by side, so that when our next scientist reads that paper, they already know that 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 result you know, was replicated internally or was not replicated internally. That's really tough. Um, and then the, the other part of that is nobody publishes negative data, um, <laughs> even internally. We don't talk about what didn't work, uh, even if we did the experiment. So that, that lack of the negative data to, to go in and do some of these veracity assessments is, is really an untapped uh, opportunity. So that was my uh, 20 minutes. I only had 10 slides. I tried to keep it short and sweet, um, but I, I hope um, I hope it was at least entertaining, if not uh, uh, insightful. But uh, I'm happy to take any questions or stay around in the in the breakout room for a few minutes afterwards. Well, thank you so much, Phil. So that's quite a lot of data that you were able to to show how you're using with different tool sets and and different techniques. Um, I'm going to come back because you're a U of I alum and make you talk a little bit about your journey as well. So you were a chemistry student on campus. And yeah, noise lab. I was there all the time. And became a data scientist. So talk to us a little bit about your yeah, journey. Yeah, so it was a uh, leadership at Abbey. It's been an ongoing journey, right? So I, I did my uh, U of I. I graduated in 89, then went to UW-Madison. Also got my PhD in chemistry uh, in 93 and came straight to, I never thought about going to industry. Um, when I was graduating, I got my, my specialization was in NMR spectroscopy and protein ligand uh, complexes through, through NMR. Um, had thoughts on going to you know, academia or a government lab, NIH or something like that. And um, Steve Fessick, who worked at Abbott at the time, came and presented and talked about how they're using structure-based drug design using NMR in, uh, in drug discovery. And they, uh, <clears throat> that hooked me, right? That you could actually apply some of these principles to, uh, to, to make an impact on human health. So I, I came here as a postdoc to Abbott at the time um, and was fortunate enough to be converted over to staff in, uh, in 1995. Now, the, my journey to data science was, <laughs> it's a bit, well, it's, it, is a, it is the story. Um, there really wasn't an IT organization to help uh, I was generating tons of data, right? And I was generating, you know, a lot of screening data. I, I led high throughput screening, chem informatics, uh, bioinformatics, and data science. And we were generating data and analyzing data. And I didn't really have anyone to help me, so I had to do it myself. So I was shadow IT. Hi, Sarah. Can you hear us? Um, I can hear someone. <laughs> but um, we, uh, I don't know how much time you want me to take up on this, but I, I basically stumbled into having to build my own informatics and IT organization uh, in order to do the work that I needed to do. And, uh, you know, that culminated in me now being, you know, crazily put in charge of the entire R&D technology organization, but basically taking the principles that, that we honed in research and tried to apply them across the entire continuum of R&D. Thank you. So we've got just a couple of minutes left as we go to our next speaker, but AbbVie Innovation Center, you referenced at the beginning with Jerome about your vision for it. Why do you think students should come work at AbbVie? What can they do in their career at AbbVie as a data scientist that maybe is different than other pathways? Uh, well, so I've talked to a number of people. If you look at the people who have come here, you know, even recently, some of the, some scientific luminaries even, 
that the the horsepower that you have, um, it, whether that's the right phrase to use, but the amount of data that we have access to, the resources that we have to either purchase data or generate data um, is really astounding, right? So if you get involved with the right uh, organization that, that can actually power um, a lot of the analyses that you want to do, you know, industry has the advantage of, of really being able to deliver that data, data at scale uh, in a way that is, that is resourced. Uh, it is a very practical application. So the, the mission for our organization um, is to unlock information that makes cures possible. Right? That's our mission statement. Um, and it's really, you know, the, the mission of being able to, everything that we do is focused on improving human health, right? The focus on the patient. So that it's a, it's a mission that I can get behind. Um, it is, you know, a, a resource that, that really helps accelerate the work. Uh, and the diversity, I, I showed you just a, a, a tiny bit of the diversity of data uh, that we deal with across the continuum that we have access to. And that's only in R&D. Um, so the same type of diversity exists in our commercial organization, in our operations organization. Uh, I was just talking yesterday about uh, government affairs has their own data science group. Um, our human resources team has their own data science group. When you think about analytics, we're doing analytics everywhere, right? In every function at Abbey in, in some way, shape or form. So it's not just restricted to research. Well, that's exciting. I hope students are inspired. There are internships available and you can apply and Jerome will guide you through that process. So thanks so much. We, we stay the largest employer of students. Yes, ILL, <laughs> thanks for returning to campus today for the Big Data Summit. Right.